welcome to the stage our next speaker, labor economist at Stanford, Myra Schober. And the good news is that next week I graduate to a cane, so very happy. I'm a labor economist. I've spent my entire career teaching and writing about women and work. And during that time, there have been spectacular changes in my field of study. When I started my career in the early 1970s, and by the way, one of the organizers of this conference um, and I, uh, met at the Stanford Business School where we were the first two women ever to teach on the Stanford Business School faculty. So I've known Fran a long time. Um, I started my career in the early 70s. Uh, when I started, most married women did not work for pay. Women who did work got 69 cents on a dollar for every dollar a man earned. And occupational segregation by gender was rampant. Women and men rarely worked in the same occupation. As the years passed, the situation for women improved. More women entered the workplace, even when they had young children. The pay gap declined. It's now 78 cents on the dollar. That's the good news and the bad news. Uh, and more and more, women have entered what were traditionally all-male occupations. But the gender revolution has stalled. The percentage of women in the labor force has declined slightly recently. The pay gap has stopped improving and we've stopped making progress in integrating occupations. Although about half of students at law schools and medical schools are now women, there's been virtually no integration in blue collar work, and very few men indeed have entered traditionally female occupations. The factors behind the stalled revolution are complex. They're not simply economic in nature. They're also historical, psychological, sociological, and political. To make progress on understanding the stalled revolution and reversing it requires cooperation among people from all of these fields. But interdisciplinary conversations about women's issues are not happening. Not only is the gender revolution stalled, so is the revolution to understand why it's stalled. I've just completed a book called Interdisciplinary Conversations. It was published last month by Stanford Press. The book is based on a study I did interviewing 40 faculty members at three research universities in the United States who participated in six different interdisciplinary seminars, year-long seminars. The topics were varied, ethics, science studies, the social sciences, inequality, representation, and consilience, how fields of knowledge can be combined. What my interviews show is how extraordinarily difficult it is for people trained in a particular di discipline to talk to one another. They're, they've developed habits of mind and disciplinary cultures that are hard to transcend. It's not just that their disciplinary languages are different. They think differently. Their assumptions, concepts, measures of methods of evaluating truth and styles of arguing are all different. And they're not tolerant of other people's ways of gaining knowledge. They're sure that their way is not only the best, but that other people's way, the unfamiliar way, is seriously deficient. So they're dismissive of unfamiliar assumptions, unfamiliar approaches to problem solving, and unfamiliar ideas. The reason why interdisciplinarity is important for problem solving is because combining and integrating ideas from multiple fields can yield more creative solutions. But that's only true if people are able to listen to one another. Let me give you an example. It's the example that begins my book. Some years ago, a colleague and I had a research project that combined history and economics to explain how and why elementary school teaching became a woman's occupation in the 19th century. Midway through the project, at a team meeting, his research assistants and mine both presented their work. My colleague students were excited. They had found several diaries of teachers, which they used to understand why teachers had entered the profession. They brought the diaries to the meeting and handled them lovingly. My students were dismissive. 
They were trained as quantitative researchers who use large data sets. They felt the diaries were unreliable, biased, representative only of those teachers who happened to write diaries. Later in the meeting, the tables were turned. My students has large piles of computer output, complex statistical regressions on economic and educational data from several states. The history students said that the quality of these 19th century data were poor, that they didn't trust them. And besides, the regressions only explained 50% of the variance, which in social science research is fabulous. But these students said, could you really think you'd explain something when half of the explanation was still unknown? My historian colleague and I explained, again, that by using both quantitative and qualitative methods, we were developing a richer understanding of the feminization process. And that while we agreed that both, method both methodologies had flaws, each one contributed something of value to solving the puzzle. We were unsuccessful in convincing the students. Here's another example of a failure of interdisciplinary interaction. One of my economist colleagues was in an interdisciplinary group to look at energy policy. Economists, political scientists, engineers, and scientists were all part of the group. I asked him recently how the conversations were going. Not too well, he said. If only they would learn to think like economists, we could make some progress. <laughs> what I learned from my research is that interdisciplinary conversations are successful when people are open-minded, when they're willing to step out of their disciplinary identities, when they play what I call the believing game rather than the doubting game. Higher education teaches us all to play the doubting game. Be critical. Don't tolerate sloppy thinking. Make sure you don't get hoodwinked into thinking something is true when it's really false. But unfortunately, people who play the doubting game are so quick to criticize that they often dismiss ideas that are in fact true or helpful. If we're to better understand women's issues and how to continue to move women's agenda forward, we need to let go of our usual assumptions. We need to be more tolerant of ideas that are unfamiliar. Instead of presuming that they're false, we need to believe them at first, listen to them carefully, and make sure that when we evaluate them, we don't close off new ideas by prematurely falling back on our disciplinary habits of thought. To make progress on understanding the complex factors behind gender roles, gender discrimination, work and family dynamics, occupational choice, and so on, we need to step out of our disciplinary identities and become open-minded. That open-mindedness will also stand us in good stead as we continue to push for fairness and equality at all levels of our society. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Please welcome to the stage our next, 